second, first of all, ask uh, Andrew Moon uh, to tell us all about himself and also some of the ideas and the thinking that he can bring to the table. Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Hi, how are you all doing? Uh, I'm Andrew Moon from a company called SWU. We, we operate in a number of different countries. Uh, we're a system for helping SMEs with grants, equity, debt, and business cost savings, um, and more of that later. Um, if I was looking to turn around to an audience and say, what would my tips, guidance, notes be based on the fact that uh, we're seeing something like 700 companies register with us per week to use our services, what would be the, the things that I'd be saying randomly could be of use for you? Um, the, the, the first thing that I would say is whatever the economic climate, you know, I would say that SMEs aren't brilliant at looking at their existing costs. So they often have too much of an eye looking to the future and too little of an eye looking at what they've already got in place. So it does make sense to look at your existing business operating costs because there are often ways of reducing those costs, which will help your business to become more cash rich as you go on. Um, I would also say it makes sense to look to find an accountancy practice that are an advisory one rather than compliance. The world's shifted, there's been a massive shift during COVID um, with a new breed of accountants who are driven to show companies how to grow rather than just how to deal with your regulatory returns. Uh, the next thing I would say is pick people's brains. There are all sorts of companies, organizations, providers, all sorts of organizations who are happy to give you bits of their knowledge to help you, either just because they're genuinely nice people or because they know if they give you useful information now, you're more likely to use them later on. So pick people's brains, it's free. Um, and the final thing that I would say, and I've done this in less than four minutes, um, is there is a world of grants out there. Um, one of the, the reasons that we formed Swoop in the first place is we realized that there wasn't an easy route for companies in the UK to find out about grants. Look for grants, they're free, they help your business. That's me for now. Looking forward to being asked questions later, thanks. Thank you, Andrew. We'll be dip, dipping a lot deeper into those subjects uh, as, as we go to the Q&A part. Um, and so now asking Victoria, Victoria, please, far away. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Vickery, and I am the founder and managing director of a company called All Star Marketing Club. And at All Star Marketing Club, we coach and train small businesses, SME businesses, on how to make sure that they can get real success from marketing uh, consistently and self-sufficiently because I'm of the opinion that you are the people that are best to do the marketing in your business. You know all about it, you're, you're passionate about it and you know your customers. So therefore it makes sense that you do your own marketing. So my world is marketing and lead generation and that's where my experience comes from for today. So if you've got any questions around marketing and lead gen, then I'm the girl for you. So a few points from me today. First of all, I think that when it comes to anything in your business, focus and clarity has to be number one. And when I'm talking about focus and clarity, I'm talking about knowing some of the obvious stuff that people tend to miss. So first of all, what are you actually selling? Are you really confident in that? And I know that sounds silly. We all know what we sell, but what is it that you need to be selling right now to make sure that your business thrives? Secondly, who are you selling it to? Having confidence on who you're targeting, that niche customer, really important. How much of it do you need to sell? What price are you selling it for? If you've got all of that in check, it makes it much easier for you to have that focus and that clarity because otherwise you spread yourself too thinly and you try to be all things to all people. So focus and clarity is number one for me because focus plus clarity gives you results-based marketing. Secondly, planning your approach. So one of the key things for me, and have a little think about whether this is you now, do you have a visibility plan? Do you have a plan that helps you to become visible amongst your ideal customers? So that's my my biggest, you know, my, my biggest thing that I can say today is if you don't have that in place, if you don't, if you're not visible, you simply are the best kept secret and no one wants to be the best kept secret. 
So it's about making sure that you're choosing the right marketing channels where your customers are showing up and being there and giving basically value, 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 value all the way. So focus marketing and visibility is going to help you to get an engaged audience. And we all need an engaged audience to sell to. Otherwise, we sell nothing at all. And thirdly, that brings me on to how to actually engage that audience in the first place. And that really depends on where they are within the process of buying from you. So I like to break this down into short term, medium term and long term marketing and lead generation. So short term being those are the people that are warm right now. And if you do the right activity, they're likely to convert. So you're warming leads. That might be things like your offers. It might be direct messaging. It might be sales calls. It could be a number of different things, consultations. They're the things that bring people towards you that are already in your world and warm. The medium term is really focusing on building relationships with those people that already are in your world, but they don't know you that well. And it's about making sure that you're building that relationship through things like your value content that you're putting out in social media, building a database of you know emails for people that you can communicate with. It's experiential marketing, things like this, like webinars. And, you know, what can you do in this way to educate people? Education is massive when it comes to kind of building that relationship. And last but not least, long term, the people that are not yet in the, your world that you want to bring in. And the way that we have to do that is thinking about branding, SEO, developing your proposition for, for existing markets and new markets, sponsorship. They're all the long term things. So it's basically about creating a leads model. No marketing is an island. Your short, medium and long term marketing has to all connect. So if you don't have that in place, a plan of how you engage and getting that visibility, that's really important. And last but not least, one of my last points I want to make really is that there are a number of different tools for you to do the job. So what we often find is that things like marketing and lead generation often gets put on the back burner when we get busy and we're serving our clients. But when time is, you know, when you're time poor, which most of us are, let's be honest, the great thing to be thinking about is finding the right tools for the job tools and people actually. So there are things that can automate repetitive tasks. There are things that can help you create leads while you sleep. There are things that you can use to measure your marketing activity. And of course there are people, people there that can, you know, the, the right experts on your side. So they're my four thoughts for you really around marketing and uh, lead generation. And I look forward to getting more in depth with those as we go through. That's brilliant, Victoria. Thank you so much. Um, and now we're going to go to Peter. Peter, please. Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, would you believe I've got an egg timer here, which I've suddenly realised is three minutes rather than four, but I've turned it over. So I'm on, on a roll here. Um, so my name is Peter Grant. Um, I'm the chief executive of WSX Enterprise and WSX Europe. We uh, try and attract funding and grants from public sector organisations, big lottery, and then turn that into... Uh, business support programs, a lot of startup activity for businesses, um, mentoring, uh, training for, uh, for disadvantaged groups in the labour market. To be honest, it's, it's an absolute sort of um, maelstrom of what we, do, what we deliver for businesses. It depends where we chase the funding. That's my job, frankly. If you talk to our people, we're trying to help as many businesses as possible to survive and grow. And... Um, when I, look, when I was thinking about the, what tips have I got, um, and there's always a danger, you, you're telling people how to suck eggs, isn't it? Uh, let me just get rid of that message there. Okay. So what we've evolved, and I'm not going to take four minutes on this one, is the, the work we've been doing with um, local authorities and using their funding is to develop a whole suite of short um, business videos, business-related videos, five, 10 minutes long. There's a hundred of them or so on all different topics. And wherever this conversation goes over the next um, hour, hour and a half, if you want us to give you um, free access to those, we're more than happy. It could be TikTok for business. It could be digital skills for beginners. It could be um, health and safety, VAT. Um, and we find that people from all over the world, frankly, are accessing these videos um, at very strange times. You can dip in and out. So that's a, that's a gimme. And if you just let Stacey know if you'd like us to get, set you up with a, a, free, a free access to those. Um, what I would say is that when we start talking about strategy for businesses, 
Um, but I'm one of those as well that starts to roll the eyes slightly. I have to present strategies for our business. Um, but the, the one sort of golden moment for me was that when somebody said to me, well, what's more important at the moment? Is it stability? Is it surviving? Is it expanding into new markets or, or, or growth? Or are you trying to sort of diversify what you do into other markets? What's the, what's the absolute center of the universe for you? Is it making as much money as possible? Is it building the business and then selling it and then retiring to the Bahamas? You know, is, are you trying to double turnover in a, in a year? And my response has always been, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I totally get we need to have that vision. And then the phone rings and someone's offering you a contract with this, that, and the other. And of course, off you go. Naturally, you've just got to follow where the um, where the business is. But just having, it doesn't have to be a um, war and peace consultant-led strategy, but having something that says, do you know what? I want this just to remain as a lifestyle business, which gives me the flexibility to work. Or I want to take over the world. I want to actually be a, a Richard Branson-level entrepreneur. Or I just want to double my turnover in five years. Do it have a couple of nuggets like that? Um, it's blindingly obvious, but it's so easy to forget. It really does help to focus the mind on, on where, you're t where you're taking things, really. Um, and, of course, the center of the universe has to be the, you know, the bottom line. Cash is king and all those sort of naive sort of phrases that sort of are true. But, you know, it's all about, the, um, it's all about our spreadsheet and our income and our cash flow. That's the center of the universe. That and digital capability which, um, you know, being the wrong side of 60, I struggle with at times. Um, I shouldn't say that, but it's true. And um, some of our business customers have made massive strides into new markets using TikTok for business, Instagram, the whole social media um, concept, which when I write bids, I often say, you know, we will use social media to get to an audience, but I never fill in the blanks. And um, again, some of these videos which we've got will help you with that and we can give you open access. I think that's three and a half minutes, Ross. I'm going to stop it there. Thanks very much. How's the egg? Well gone. Thank you. Cool. Okay, thanks, Peter. That's great. Um, and now, finally, uh, Alpa, please. Hello. Good morning to you all, and thank you for joining us here today. So my name is Alpa Shingardia. Uh, I am a seasoned NED, an executive director, uh, with over 20 years um, experience leading strategic uh, initiatives. I specialize in partnering with high growth companies that require expert guidance in building strong end-to-end -end user experiences. My unique skill set really lies in bringing together cross-functional teams uh, to, de uh, to deliver seamless solutions that drive results. Um, I collaborate with senior leadership teams and that enables me to sort of identify and solve some of the complex issues uh, related to customer and client offerings, and also leads to profitable growth. Over the last decade, I've worked closely with numerous um, companies um, and industries and successfully helped them in all of their strategic goals. So what Peter, Victoria, Andrew are all saying, I'm gonna resonate with. Um, all of these things are key in, 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 in growing. I also am a consultant for a company called Brand New in Business Support. And we also work closely with chambers of commerce and local authorities. Um, and we provide um, business advice and support uh, to those members and businesses in those communities. Um, we have a large range of consultants um, across a myriad of backgrounds. And those are the people that will deliver some of the work. Okay, so today I really want to put the spotlight on the priorities around trading growth, new ventures and business development. In this current climate, it's so easy for us to talk ourselves into a recession. But we're here today to look at things differently. Mindset is really key in this. To explore the challenging nature of um, opportunities and the context of challenges in our globally connected market, because it is globally connected. But if we view recession as a state of mind, then let's definitely change our approach. The current climate, I believe, is an opportunity to innovate and to think creatively. I can't, 
I, I refuse. I refuse and I refuse to allow my clients to have the fear of recession hold them back from taking risks and new ventures. So at this event that we're all attending today, what we're trying to do is figure out what the best antidote is. There's no right or wrong answer. It's, it's anything and everything that works. The most important thing is that we do not read the economic news because every single piece of news you read, there's a political agenda somewhere. So we need to sort of read a lot of different things and actually take a, a, a proper view on it. That's not to say interest rates won't have an impact on you if they, if they raise them again, which I believe they are, or lending is going to be harder. All of those things are there, but it's, it's a state of mind. Um, so what we want to learn from each other today, I think, is to share our experiences and ideas and to find ways to grow our business despite the challenges that we face. Okay, so for me, the uh, trading growth is a key priority. So if I was going to give you a couple of tips, one of the things I would say is um, look for new markets and customers. Don't limit yourself to a current database, uh, to a cur to a current um, customer base. Explore new markets and find ways to expand your reach. I have various customers that are currently doing that. We've done a lot of market research around those industries. We've then gone away to think about how we would communicate with those industries and what they indeed are going to buy. So that's really my first point in, in um, trading growth. There's many, but I'll cover that one. The next one I think is um, in new ventures is don't be afraid to try new things and take new risks. So innovation is key. So here, let me give you an example. Um, two web developers, one of my clients, both of them had a call. One presented a, a proposal in a normally word in a normal word document as everyone else does. The other web developer, her proposal was a web page. She from day one was showing her expertise and her skill. Who do you think won that business? She was also more expensive just for the record, by a good £3,000. But she blew my client away with how she presented pretty much what she, you know, what the other guy was doing. They're building a website, but her presentation was key. So when you are presenting something, think differently. Think outside of the box. What is going to make you stand out from the crowd? Uh, number three, I think, and I touched on this before, is monitor trends and shifts. Stay up to date with what's going on in your market. As a small business owner, we are so busy chasing that next lead, doing this, doing that. We sometimes don't stop and think, where is my market going? Is it changing? Is new AI technology going to have an impact on how I'm doing stuff? What do I need to understand to stay ahead of the curve? So monitor those, those um, shifts and, and, and trends. And the last point I'm going to mention is focus on your key strengths. While it's really important to be adaptable, don't lose sight of your core strength and what makes your business unique. Um, and use these strengths to guide and pivot you as the economy, as the business world changes. So don't know how long I've taken, hopefully it was less than four minutes, but those are my key points um, that I will share with you today. And I'm sure we'll delve into far more as the event goes on. Thank you. Thanks, Alpa. Um... As I say in the chat, please get your questions ready. Uh, you can use the reaction signs to, on, on the screen just to, uh, if you want to ask a question or you can put it into the chat. If you wave at me, I'll also see that. So please do, if you've got any questions, please get ready because we're about to start that part. I've got a few that, I've, that um, we've already been considering and uh, in conversation with some businesses have come forward. And uh, Peter, maybe Peter and Alpha will have a go at this one. But it's, um, you know, we we are in tough times on this. So what's more important? Um, is it the stability, you know, stabilising your current business? Or is it sort of all pressing ahead on expansion and growth? Or is it is it diversification? What, what's the balance that we really need to do? P Peter, have a go, and then I'll ask Alpha to comment as well. Okay, and I'll probably use um, the example of our, our company, you know, warts and all, to actually maybe help to, you know, paint the picture. I mean, two things really. Firstly, um, you know, in a previous life, I started and then sold a, a wedding supplies business, 
Um, it's a very strange business to get into, but it just it just happened. And um, and that was sort of jam tomorrow. It was a case of new products that come on, come across from America. It was fairly not easy, but it was it was just treading the boards, going to hotels, showing the showing these new sort of um, uh, fads for wedding dressing rooms and what have you. It's bizarre. I couldn't tell you how that happened. Um, and it just grew like topsy, and it snowballed, and um, and suddenly there were eight competitors in the marketplace. And because we'd grown in size and had a business unit, two vans, four staff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the man or one man or one woman type business, someone in their garage, was able to undercut us massively, and. There was a slightly painful decision in that respect of, well, are we going to try and uh, use our reputation and keep going? Or shall we just, uh, well, the market's great and we've got a good order book. Let's um, let's sell the business. So this is my first example. Then I'll move on to WSX Enterprise in a second. Um, so that was the easy one in a way. We thought, right, we've got a good order book, our order book, but we can see that the sort of the graph is starting to slow as people are undercutting us. Um, left, right, and center. Um, are we going to diversify? Are we going to try and go into new markets? Um, we tried new markets. We took what we were doing in Hampshire and Isle of Wight and knocked on the doors in Dorset and Surrey and Wiltshire and gradually just sort of spread the spread the map out. And, um, and how naive were we? Because people had actually worked out that there was this new way of dressing weddings, so all the sort of glitz and the bows and the banners and God knows what, all the sort of illuminated stuff. And they just started up anyway. So we thought we were that unique. And it was only when we sort of went into the People's Republic of Dorset or further afield, we realized everyone else was doing it. So that was an easier decision that we thought, okay, let's sell the business and and um, and, and move on. But that was, an, not for this discussion now, but how do you know how much your business is worth? You know, you could talk to 16 there'd be people on this call now that have got more experience of this than we had at the time. But how do you, how do you make a judgment for what, what your business is worth? And all we ever got from people was it's, it's your order book. And that's all that ever really took us anywhere. Um, sorry, there's a labradoodle about to sort of just throw itself through the glass panel. Hold on. That's okay. Uh, sorry about that. But then with WSX Enterprise, our experience of, just as Ross said, what are we trying to do at the moment? We've lost Brexit, has taken away probably about 40% of our business, which was European-based, um, European contracts. In fact, ironically, this month is the last month of our European portfolio coming to an end. So it's not rocket science, but we thought, let's set up in Dublin, a sister company, WSX Europe, which then gives us the eligibility to still be involved in, in European projects um, and to continue on that sort of path. And we did that. And in the UK, because we're reliant so much on government funding, big lottery funding, local authority funding, um, the wheels have come off to probably about 40% again because of the fragmentation since... Um, since uh, Mr. Sunak has taken over the reins, um, Boris is levelling up uh, agenda. A lot of the money has gone to the north. So, yeah, what are we going to do about that? So for us, it's been a, we're in the trenches. We're about sustainability. But I still, in a, on a bad day, wake up and think, well, what else can we be delivering elsewhere that is of, of, of value to people? And... Um, and we found in it with our sort of products, as it were, mentoring, training, uh, business solutions. Well, people in Skegness or Pool or the Isle of Wight can just as easily find local, local sources for that. So we were, we were right in the middle of that dilemma on that sort of, uh, yeah, how do you stabilize? How do you sustain and grow? Um, grows on the back burner. We're sustaining at the moment and building a, a sort of tighter portfolio locally. Um, but is that the right approach? You know, should we be more bullish? Should our senior managers be sort of out there trying to look for new markets, 
um, new products, new activity. I'm still not convinced we've got it right. So I'm just being very honest with you here. It changes every week. But at the end of the day, if there's a contract to be bid for, that's where we'll go. And that's a, that's that's sort of our, our mantra, really. Um, but Europe is good for us at the moment, perversely, with Brexit. Um, the home market, you know, it's it's just about sort of um, stable at the moment. Well, I just can't see growth um, from what, what, we're, what we're delivering, our product range, our services. Um, but it's a, it's a sort of mindset we had to go through. You know, are we stabilizing? Are we diversifying? Are we trying to grow? And that in itself, remember I, I rattled on about strategy earlier, that in, its, in, its isol- in itself was a, a valuable exercise just to um, steady the ship and help focus the sort of moves we're going to make to stabilize and make sure the cash flow is is, is um, as sustainable as it is. Thank you, Peter. That, that is brilliant. And the insights in your own business, I think, are really valuable. Alpa, what, what advice would you give? Because I think Peter's touched upon the 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 very difficult issues about do you, do you build and stabilise where you are? Do you make sure you, you keep what you've got? Or do you take some even more risks? Double equips? Go for it. Which what's what's the angle from your point of view, Alpa? I think it's both. I don't think it's one or the other. And I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I disagree, Peter. Um, I think both all these plates have to spin. Um, otherwise, you you end up talking yourself into what we're trying to say. We're, we're not trying to talk ourselves into. I think um, having a very clear strategic plan, but being prepared to pivot. Um, a lot of the times we we go down a road, that's all we're focusing on, and and we and we we um and that's it. Whereas I don't think that is how business works. I think business has to you, you've got to be able to move and navigate through a bit like a fish swimming through um, seaweed things like that. Forgive the analogy, but that's um that's um, a key thing for me. And I and I think it's you know investing. In, in 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 the right team giving the team the right tools to do what they need to do more efficiently i think it's um you know it's it's maybe talking to you know collaborating with other businesses and other business partners understanding how they're tackling things all of those things i think are key um i i just for, for, for me when i'm working at board level we have various plates spinning and every week there's a challenge and there's always a challenge but it's it, it's being able to sort of prioritise what those challenges are, um, and it's not just looking for them, you know. Because in with SMEs, that's the thing that that we we do. Unless it's a lifestyle business that you're looking for, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're looking for growth and you want to, you know, develop something that you might want to exit from, then you you your strate- your strategic plan has to change. But you have to be aware of what is going on around you, um, and you have to be able to pivot. And I think. It's not one or the other. I think they are both equally important. Um, you know, so when you invest in digital technology, that will um, that technology will only work if you spend the time to understand what your problem you're trying to solve and what your outcome needs to be from that. So for me, everything is about outcomes. It isn't about a knee jerk reaction to what's going on right now because what's going on right now is always going to go on right now. But there's an overall plan. That's my outcome. And I will have to pivot to get there. I'll have to go through different paths. I might have to climb a mountain. I might have to ski down something. But whatever it is, I'm prepared to understand that terrain and and get to that um, to, to that result. But it is about outcomes. Set your goals and, and focus in on that. You know, it's not be all and end all in my mind, Ross, if I'm honest. Thank you, Alpa. Um... Rebecca actually did have a question for us, but uh, unfortunately she's had to go. She's got a she's got a important matter, but she points out that pivot is absolutely the key. So I think we agree with that. Victoria, I mean, if we look at, if we're looking at this, um, I mean, the, the old phrase of USPs or uniqueness or whatever always comes into play. So you have to understand what you are in order to make it work. But how can a business find out and define their uniqueness? you know, in what are quite complex and quite crowded markets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
and when it comes to uniqueness, it's not always about being unique. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been built that are unique that are absolutely terrible and not fit for purpose. So I think it's about finding your value to your customers. And um, and again, if anybody, Stacey, something to, to let everyone know afterwards, I do have a really nice little handout that helps with kind of delivering that unique value proposition. So if anybody would like to get their hands on that, they are more than welcome to it. But for me, it's um, thinking about, and this is really important in marketing um, anyway, but it's thinking about outcomes. So taking it from what is it that your customers actually need from you? Of course, pains, wants, needs, concerns, worries, what keeps them awake at night, all that jazz. But then thinking about, okay, I'll take that on board, but what are the outcomes that I actually deliver? Because when we're thinking about what customers want, they don't buy products and services, they buy transformation. And I think that from that perspective, when we're thinking about what our unique value is, we need to identify with what the, you know, the outcomes are that we're delivering to our customers. So I think that's what's, that's one of the core things when you're thinking about your unique value and how you actually market that. So that's one thing that I definitely say you need to be thinking about. Um, and therefore, if you can identify what those outcomes are that you need to be delivering, well, what is it that you do to solve those problems? And how do you do it in a way that's different to everybody else? Um, and I always think about kind of the positioning triangle in a marketing term. So you can look at this, it's kind of a textbook thing. You'll have people that come from a place of, you know, the lowest cost for with operational efficiency. You'll have those people that come from a customer excellence perspective, and you'll have those that come from a, a place of innovation. And it's knowing where you sit relative to your competitors, because if you sit right in the center, when it comes to the value that you bring, you're just in a bum fight amongst your competition. It's really important to kind of know your place and where you sit and the value that you bring to your customers. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a couple of things. It's also really important to think about who do you actually love working with and how does your value meet with those? Because you don't have to serve everybody. You do get to choose. Um, you don't just have to go after, you know, think about your customer base. Who do you love working with and who don't you love working with? Well, build your value around those people that you really want to work with, those people that, you know, mean something to you and help you to achieve your own personal goals and business goals as well. Um, so, yeah, that's my advice really is to think about the transformation. How do you get people to where they want to go? Uh, making sure that you take into account, you know, what you do to get them there, who it is that you really want to work with. And, you know, think about when somebody says to you, wow, that was amazing. That was so helpful. That was so good. That was so useful. What is it they're saying that about? Because often that's where the uniqueness is. It's not always in the thing that you're delivering, but how you go about doing it. So if you thought food, food for thought there, Ross. Thank you, Victoria. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, Andrew, I noticed that when you were doing your presentation, of course, you talked a lot about grants. We all love grants, Andrew, but um, there are all, always issues around getting them. There are restrictions and requirements. But firstly, where do we find them? How do we find them? And and then what are, what are the few things that we really need to know about them? What a lovely question. Thank you very much, Ross. Um, uh, very quick recap. Our platform can be accessed via the Chamber of Commerce. Stacey will be able to give everyone a link. Yeah. To register on the platform, you add your company. The system says, what are you looking for? Are you looking for grants? Are you looking for equity? Are you looking for debt? Keep this simple, you're looking for grants. You tick grants, you answer a very small number of questions. Then our system shows you all of the grants that your business is matched with based on your sector, your location, and actually also shows nationwide grants. So we've got something like 400 grants on the system. The problem in the UK is that people don't know where to look. If you just talk to an SME directly, they will say, well, I've looked and gave up. Yeah. What our system does is it matches you with all of the grants, shows you the summary of how they work, and you go ahead and apply directly. We don't charge anything. We don't receive anything. There's no cost for you. And if you find a grant that you like, you apply directly and you get the money happy days. But grants refresh. So one of the things that we say to SMEs is if when you first look, there are, let's say, 10 grant matches, make a note in your calendar to look every eight weeks and you'll see new grants as they pop up. 
if you look and you can see one graph patch, you know, probably don't check that often. If you see 30, check more frequently. There are two sorts of grants. There are capital grants and innovation grants. Capital grants are the small ones, you know, and they'll come from things like your local LEP, the lottery, there's all, there's, there's loads and loads and loads out there. It could be a grant for getting a new boiler. Yeah, it could be a grant towards a piece of machinery. They're designed to help Planet GB grow. Okay. Um, and the small grants should be really easy to apply for. So use the system, look for grants. The money's, there, there's no recourse with grants. You don't need to pay the money back. Yeah. Um, the other sort of grant, and hopefully not teaching people things they know already, are innovation grants. So let's say you came up with a, a, a clever idea. You're running a business that makes chandeliers, and you go, goodness, what would happen if we made our chandeliers out of recycled uh, wood? Bizarre example. Now, um, you'd be able to see if there are any innovation grants for that. And their innovation grants are the big ones. They start at 100. The average size that companies that we deal with are winning are about 400,000. So if you win a grant of 400,000 pounds, that can be transformative for your business. Yeah. Um, so people don't look at grants because in their minds, they think it as a being a difficult thing to look for. Yeah. Be proactive, look after your business. Yeah. Um, I was talking a couple of years ago to one of the labs that we work with, and they were saying that they just announced a new grant fund for about 10 million quid. And that the CEO of the LEP was saying, do you know what? The most frustrating thing is yeah, that we get so few people who apply for them um, and we've got to allocate as much of the money as we possibly can. Yeah? And what will often happen is you get the same old faces who are in the grant, who know there are grants, who will keep applying and not get it. Yeah, um, And we've got this money that we're trying to get out. And we can't find a way of getting it out there. I might not have said it's that articulately, but... Take government grant money, help your business. That's me. Andrew, I think, you're, yes. I think you're spot on. Sorry. Yeah, Andrew, I think you're spot on. A lot of the time when I'm working with businesses, they're always saying, well, we need more funding. We we, we need to introduce me to a, to a VC. And I'm like, why would you want to give away equity in your business? You know, that's the first thing when you don't need to. And I often say to them about grants, but the biggest thing I've found is they say, We'll never get them. And that is something that I think we is, is something that the chamber and a lot of us need to start to change that messaging because and, and anyone can get a grant. And they can see there are 10 grant matches. Exactly. They read them and go, no, no, no. Oh, that one is really me. And they apply. Yeah, but then, they, then the fear kicks in and then they don't do it or it, they feel it's laborious or it's painful. And that's the other challenge. Um, you know, and you know, and then I say to them, well, look, there's plenty of companies out there that can help you with your grants. So, you know, hire one of those. If you get four hundred thousand pounds or hundred thousand pounds, it's well worth the investment, and learn how to do it through that. So we can we can help with the with the innovation grants. We've got people who would help write the grant application because the chance of success if you do it yourself is about five percent. Yeah, but for the smaller grants, our, our audience, it's probably not worthwhile paying somebody to help you write a grant application for a 10 grand grant, because they'd have to charge you probably a thousand pounds and they have to charge you that whether you win it or not. So yeah, look at the grant, check to see if it sounds like you and apply directly. Thanks Thank so much, time. Andrew. Peter, um, someone quite questions from, from, from you all, from the audience, please put your hand up if, if, you, if you've got one, otherwise I'll keep firing away, uh, but I, I'd really like to hear from you. John, please. So my question was, and I put it in the chat actually to both uh, Peter and Andrew, was um, the business I work for has been um, in existence for over 32 years, providing health and safety solutions primarily. Um, so of late, we've considered to uh, franchise areas of the country, uh, essentially to people who may come either out of the military or out of a redundancy situation. Um, but has essential uh, health and safety skills. So, so sometimes they may have a pot of money they can draw on 
to finance the the franchise area or they would be looking to fund it so john is that a full format franchise or a sales franchise for eternity what, what what kind of franchise are you talking about just yeah. and then we'll, we'll get we'll get we'll get peter i think to have a first crack at that maybe victoria as well what, yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts john uh, so it would be it would be somebody coming to the market with essential health and safety skills that can sell those services into a geographical area. Thank you, John. Peter, okay. what do you think? Okay, well, a good friend of mine, um, made redundant from uh, Texaco, taken on a, um, a health insurance uh, franchise. You know, one of the one of the big brands uh, covering the southwest. And uh, he probably won't mind me saying it. Well, he probably would, but he's not here. And it cost him about um, £15,000. And uh, the first six months, he's thinking, what the heck am I doing? Um, but he got support from the, the host. I and mean, I'm not an expert in franchising, but we do see from our customers as well that you know, there's, there's more, of a, a more of a ripple of that these days than um, perhaps old school franchising that was always seen as a, you know, perhaps a sort of a bit of a money spinner for the for the organisation. Mm. Um, one I will mention to you though is the is the military side. We we've got a place in Aldershot where we're training um, uh, training and supporting and giving a managed environment with offices to um, startups, and about forty percent of those obviously are military related and um, military dependents, families, and and so on and so mm. forth. And and we've got to know the uh, they call the Careers Transition Partnership (CTP) in Aldershot, and um, these people have got the government contract, the MOD contract, to do all the outplacement and all the sort of training for people leaving the military. Yeah. And yeah, you know, crudely, it's about six or six month program. It mm -hmm. covers everything from job finding to CVs, all the old sort of stuff like that. Mm. But um, do you know what? I'm not sure anybody's doing franchising. Mm. with ctp so um i know there's a woman called ruth and she's in my diary somewhere mm. that, uh, based in aldershot she runs the ctp mm. they're always looking for guest speakers and ways to um ways to uh you know aid the sort of service people coming out it's predominantly army mm. ctp also cover i don't work with them directly um yeah but, um navy in portsmouth devonport so on and so forth huge mm. organization but well, that would be a good in to get to the, um, you're right, the, the military coming out, a lot of them want to run their own business. Mm. So we've got about a dozen in our place at uh, Aldershot. Mm. And, um, yeah, there are probably people on this call now who have, uh, have military links or ex-military themselves. And um, they, they do stand out, you know, their mm. focus and their sharpness. I mean, it's a bit yeah. of a brush, but it's, it's fairly true. So, uh, yeah, we might be able to help steer you towards the CTP um, again, I'll, I'll pick up with Rachel. Get your details. In fact, I can see. Yeah, it's all there in the um, in the chat. Lovely. Thank I'll, you. I'll take some uh, some notes in a minute. Thank you, Peter. Thanks so much, Peter. I mean, I mean the um, essence of um, yes. franchising the business was for practical and financial reasons because the business has been very successful serving large business, large organisations like the NHS, and then really small CM SMEs that can't afford a full time health and safety person. But the ability for us to provide those services in the Midlands or the north of England are constraints around putting a, an auditor into a car, hotel stay, and yeah, it just made us uneconomical. But the franchising model seemed to be, you know, the, the way to go. Thank yeah. you. Can I just talk. come quickly on that, um, Ross? Yes, please. Use an example of the, um, the wedding company that we had. Um, yeah, we had grand designs at one stage about let's go franchising, you know, mm. um, but it was from a base of, well, you've got no real brand. You're just doing mm. something locally successfully in Hampshire. Mm. Um, so our mid ground was, and we, we stumbled across the barrier you just talked about. Well, let's just employ a courier company to take all the kit to mm. wed a wedding in Broadstairs or a wedding in Chelmsford mm. and um, get a special rate from the courier, long term relationship. That's going to be a win. That's all great till something goes wrong on site, you mm -hmm. know. And um, we had someone drive into yeah, drive into Essex at yeah you know, three in the morning because there was a the tablecloths weren't right or something. Mm -hmm. It's all that sort of crazy stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, no franchise. I, I 
think we missed an opportunity, but mm. I don't think we were big enough or bold enough at the time to, to take the mm. step. But I think the military one is a good spin, actually. Yeah. Let's talk more about that. Okay. John, John, Victoria, do you have an experience of, uh, in, in this particular field? So in terms of franchising, no, not really. It's something that I've considered for my own business along the years, but I do have some thoughts, um, you know, from, from my own knowledge. Um, and there's three things really for that I would be thinking of for you, John, at this point. Yeah. And first of all, um, with anything, when you go into franchising or, you know, indeed a successful business, there mm. needs to be marketing capability there. Mm. So uh, one of the, from, you know, from your perspective, being able to hand over a, mm. a, a, gener a, a lead generating, a business generating model to your franchisee. So they're actually able to pick it up and make a success from it. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be marketing in terms of giving them all of the tools they need to be marketing as in marketing training. So there's lots of different avenues there. And obviously, mm -hmm. I'm speaking from a marketing and lead generation perspective. So yeah. that's the first thing I'd be thinking of is, you know, going into franchising. Do you have that kind of um, growth capability set up to help your franchise franchisees to succeed? Mm -hmm. um, the second part is I think that, um, you know, what you've heard already around accessing people through the few so access the many through the few so going out to the right people that already have those uh, relationships with your target audience is a really good idea mm -hmm. and I think initially just going out and putting the feelers out there as to what does this market look like what are the opportunities in the market mm -hmm. and from that you can then start thinking about more of a volume game where you can kind of put a marketing plan behind it but you know First of all, just do the research. That's a really important part is to understand mm. the market, first of all, and the opportunities. But once you understand that, then you can play more of the marketing game and let mm. that do more of the heavy lifting for you. Um, the only other thought I have around this, because as I say, I've been thinking about the franchise model for myself. and uh, It's not something that I'm going to do anytime soon, but it's certainly something that I can see as a, as a way forward for businesses like yours, like mine, you know, those things where you've got a model that exists and you can recreate it. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I would really be thinking about is how you actually package up what you actually have for franchising mm. or even for selling. And that kind of counts for every business, really. Yeah. There's this thing of we provide health and safety or I provide marketing trading. But at mm. the end of the day, how is that packaged up and how can you present it to market in a way that feels really compelling? Because mm. things are much easier to buy than services are so mm. it's just making it really kind of easy from a marketing perspective to to talk about to sell to get buy into uh, so that's that's kind of an important part of it for me in franchising is having the right proposition development around it so that you've got something really nice and uh, meaty to be able to go to market with for my sins john i developed a franchise in the travel industry in the 1980s so oh, okay. uh, we might have a short conversation about that at some at some yeah. stage but yeah. there's there, it, there's there's a lot of upside and a lot of downside, but you know it's 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 a good track. Do get in touch with the BFA, the British Franchise yeah. Association, because yeah. um, they are very full format franchise oriented, and there are hybrids mm. between the two. But but uh, it's certainly there. You'll learn a lot. So and we're going to go uh, Dawn, and then we're going to go Andrew, and then we've got Alpa mm. because we've got three hands up, and uh, I don't mind what the subject is, whether it's on the franchise or whether it's a new question. But, but Dawn's been waiting, so please, Dawn, first, what's your question? Sorry. Um, so I, uh, my question, um, uh, apologies for being late, so it may have been covered, so if it has, just, just uh, wave at me. Uh, but as I put in the chat, um, we run a series of small businesses. Um, a lot of them are venue based so they're hard to scale because you know Fersey Gardens is a visitor attraction we can't sort of pick it up and put it down somewhere else um, and we run quite a lot of cafes and things like that so my question is I've heard that a lot of people talking about options of either um, either going for growth or sustainability and I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about is actually a lot of our businesses are quite low margin operations so what's been going around in my head is how how do I look other than just cost cutting <laughs> which I know about it, um, but you know how, how do we try and turn a low margin operation into something that um, can secure higher margins perhaps by add, you know, adding something on 
to the offer um that's the sort of area that I'm thinking about and I'm just interested I haven't heard many people particularly talking about that one at the moment Dawn just to dig in a little bit deeper what what kind of thing are you doing where you and, and what areas are you thinking about how you could add that kind of value and improve your margin specific, specifically so um I guess so at our cafes uh you know cafes are, are, are you know tend to be quite a low margin offer but I sort of feel there's a that little bit of if you can oh yeah I went I went to one near here and they they they, they had their award winning cinnamon bun or something <laughs> you know but it, you know, what is it that makes people pay more for things what is it and it's all about emotional value I think picking up Vic, Victoria's point rather than the actual you know cost of a cup of tea um but it's just trying to get to so we've got cafes that offer just standard standard fare um we've got Fursy Gardens which is I think around you know it only costs people eight pound to get into the gardens you can bring your own picnic so although we've got a tea rooms you know the visit is eight pounds so you know what you know how do we add other things onto the package other opportunities that people go oh wow I really don't want to you know go what's to the gardens words? and miss out on that thing what's so, your group's um, turnover what's the group's turnover um overall our turnover is around six and a half million okay but not that's not all in these small businesses that's because we also operate so at, at um social care contracts as well so it's all within the same business so uh, okay i would say that with that sort of a turnover you're right for talking to somebody like alpa in terms of getting the brains of someone else who's able to listen to what you're doing and go great we could explore this we could look at that we could look at the other etc etc um, you took the words right out of my mouth 60, Andrew. <laughs> 650 000 probably wouldn't be commercially viable but the turnover you've got that makes sense yeah yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, it might be worth having um, a, a chat um, yeah. because, uh, you know, being in, in this environment, until you look under the hood, it, you know, there could be some help and advice and tips. Mm. I'm more than happy to give in terms of how you can increase um, that value. So um, I think we need to delve a bit deeper. And then, yes, I'm, I'm sure I'd be able to, sort of, you know, think of some things that you could maybe um, think about imp implementing. Um, the reason I had my hand up um, was to really touch on John's point. Um, so, John, I've actually created a franchise in Victoria. It was in marketing. I had an outsourced marketing company. And I'm going to say it was not very successful. And so when you're embarking on a franchise, everyone's telling you what you should do about the things that you don't do. Uh, First thing that you um, that you don't do is before you start recruiting franchisees, make sure you have proper legal agreements, your training for the franchisee. Because remember, a, a franchisee is buying a franchise because they feel more comfortable in in that environment as opposed to somebody who's just going to set up a business and 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 fly. There's nothing wrong with either or, but they're looking for stability, structure. That they want to know everything's done, the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, that they've got the help and support that they need. So before you embark on selling franchisees a package, ensure that all your ducks are in a row. It is robust. It is, um, it can withstand challenge because when you're in the training, when you're training these franchises, they will challenge you and you need to be able to um, to hold your own in in in, in that um, and the other thing I'd say is before you go franchise creating a franchise ensure that your business offering is is stable that it's easily you can replicate it easily um, and it's not just something that you know you think is a great idea for scaling up because that will bring countless issues with it um, so within my marketing franchise um, the sales bit of it was the challenge, how you teach the, a marketing person how to do sales. Um, and actually, the, the, the business itself wasn't robust enough. So we got three franchisees, 
and within six months they'd all drop because we weren't able to support them in the way they needed um, and they um, they then lost interest and it ended up costing a lot of money legal fees it, it was a it was a nightmare so whilst I think franchising is a great way to scale and lots of businesses do it there's a word of caution in there as well um, not to say don't do it but really know your strategy everything about your business before you embark on it or spend too much money on it thanks Al for that. I think I think what we need what we want is uh Victoria have you got it we'll, we'll come on to Andrew in one second but Victoria have you got any views to help Dawn with regard to with regard to the challenges because this productivity yeah. issue in the service sector is quite tough isn't it how you improve you grow your margins but within maybe similar environments you haven't transformed it totally what, what what's your advice Victoria yeah, I, I did want to come back to Dawn, so that that's good. I think um, Alpa's absolutely right, though. Until you can kind of get into the nitty gritty of it, Dawn, it's it will be hard to give you any kind of you know solid advice. So definitely talk to Alpa. Uh, my door is absolutely open for a chat from a marketing and lead generation perspective. So please do make contact with me, and that goes for anyone. If anyone wants to have a chat with me about their marketing and lead generation, my door is open for um, a complimentary chat. So by all means, get in touch. But Dawn, I'm thinking about you um, and what you've got there. And it comes really back to um, sense checking everything that you've got happening already. So, for example, um, have you maxed out on things like your sales and marketing to make sure that, you know, any um, quiet periods are filled in, um, you know, any you know, in the cafes at Fursey Gardens? So, you're, you know, you're in our neck of the woods. So, um, first of all, that's one of the things I'll be looking at. And if that's not the case then your first port of call is really to look at how to maximise what you already have um, and making sure that you are busy in the non-busy times and you have got all of that thing, that kind of thing going on. And then I'll be looking at things like, right, who is the audience that we're trying to attract here? So you might have a core audience at Fursey Gardens, for example, in the daytimes with mums with, um, you know, preschool age uh, children. I'm just talking about Fursey Gardens, but this goes for everywhere. Um, you might have a market for families at the weekend. But what about those other times? Is there a way for you to look at new audiences to bring them in? And if so, what is it that you can do across all of your portfolio of businesses? What is it that you can do to attract that new audience? And what offerings do you need to have to do that? And you're also in a fort fortunate position where you've got multiple um, businesses and multiple propositions. And I'm also thinking about, and I don't know if you do this already, but one of the, the core ways that I often advise businesses on is how to make sure that you've got continuity income. Uh, and that goes for a lot of businesses here would be able to you know, introduce this model because it's all well and good. Somebody coming along and paying eight pounds each time they visit and they might come once a quarter. But once you've got kind of um, skin in the game with a business and um, or, uh, um, you know, Fertig Gardens, cafes, whatever it might be, once you're consistently paying and you form a relationship, so branding comes into this quite a lot, but the continuity game might be something for you to exploit because what you've got there is the makings of several different locations. And I'm thinking along the lines of packaging, memberships, all of that kind of thing. And, you know, whether that's at just one location or bringing all of the locations together in, in a kind of, you know, Merlin style pass where you can go around all of them. Um, and there's things that you can add on. So when it comes to the value game and, you know, when you have got low ticket products and services to sell, often you need to be thinking about the additional value that you can add that is high value to those individuals that are part of it. But actually, it's low cost to you so that your margin's not eroded. So I'd be having a little think about some of the things that you can do there. So, uh, for example, you might have um, a membership to it all. But within that mem membership, each year they get this, this and this as a bolt on to what they've already got. Um, I've done this quite successfully with a local dog walking business. So um, to give you a feel for it, and this might help other people as well on the call today. They had a model whereby if you wanted your dog taken care of, you show up, you pay your 20 odd quid a day, your dog's taken care of. And they might then say, right, I want my dog looked after two days a week, three days a week. And there's no um, commitment to it. Whereas what we've done with this particular business, they're very successful now. 
they've now got a membership in place where they collect that money before the month even starts. And on an ongoing basis, they've got that recurring revenue coming in the door. So I feel like there's something to look at here, actually, Dawn. Um, and just getting that value, that value proposition and that emotive side of things and that branding and letting people feel that connection to the business more that will keep them kind of sticky and paying time and time again. And like I say, just adding more value into an ongoing thing um, so that you're not eroding margins, but there's a lot of reason to, to be part of what you're doing. Thank you, Victoria. That is superb. Um, uh, and I think, obviously, take it up with uh, Alp and with Victoria after the call, Dawn, because, you know, they'll be very happy. You know, we're all part of the same community, but you're very happy to help you and to 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 steer you and to open up some of that thinking. Andrew, and I, I want to hear from you. You've had your hand up, but whilst whilst you're also doing that, I do have a little question for you as well. So you might you might, might want to uh, you know proffer the the advice. Maybe it was for John or or whatever. But also, I'm interested because we've been through quite a tough time in the last few years, and some businesses are not as financially strong and healthy as they might be. So you know they. They, they might look at their balance sheet, they might look at their credit score, and they might think, actually, some of some of the solutions available to me, and, and Peter might have some thinking on this as well, may, are, are at a bit of a stretch. And and actually, I'm rather difficult to borrow more money or to even in, attract investment in my business, simply because of the last four years that we've all experienced. So that, that might be a question for you, Andrew, but also please fire away with what you were wanting to say. Uh, right, I'll try and do three things, uh, three things at once. Um, uh, Dawn, first of all, Dawn, let's say that you had come on to our platform and you were going, I wonder how we can help. Yeah, Dawn, uh, quick reminder, we're equity, grants, debt and business cost savings. Uh, equity, probably unlikely to be of relevance. Uh, grants, there could well be some, some grants for your business, yeah, having heard what you do. Um, on the debt side, what the team would be saying is, are the ways that we can further reduce, you said you've looked at your costs, are the ways that costs can be reduced? So, uh, for instance, would be the buildings that you've got where the cafes are, are probably either at present going to be leasehold or freehold. If they're leasehold, it would make sense to check with our commercial property team rather than paying your annual cost to a owner of the property yeah to check if it made sense to buy the property um so you've got an asset that's improving the value of the business if they're freehold to go on to our commercial property tracking service yeah. um, uh, for the cafes that you've got do you have solar panels in place do you have heat pumps get you to go into our utility tracking service so that we're looking to minimize um, your utility costs so that, that wouldn't be a, a an Alpa type solution, but it'd be looking to reduce your costs and give you potentially capital to scale the business. Okay, so that was, that was Dawn, okay. Um, John, um, again, you could talk to our team to explore the franchising side. Yeah. Um, two quick anecdotal things. Um, there's a, a, an accountancy network that we deal with who've looked to grow their network by franchises. Um, so they send us all of the people who are looking to set up new franchises, okay? And one of the things that we found, yeah, is that to get the funding for the person to go and get the new franchise, because they might well have been made redundant, yeah, it's often really quite hard for them to get the funding to be able to get themselves set up. They can use things like startup loans, which we're directly accredited for, um, but they take a while. Yeah, um, there are there is a bank that likes the franchising model. Yeah, um, that bank would need to see a strong business plan to be able to go. All oh, right, that makes sense. Yeah, um, but generally the success rate is pretty low, so you're going to have to face up the fact you're going to have a massive amount of churn of wasting your time. On the other side, we deal with a number of international organizations who are successful in the franchising world. Uh, one's a big gym group, yeah, 
And what we're doing with them is getting their franchises to be able to grow so that they're getting growth equipment, money for funding to grow the practices, money to go and buy the franchises. So it's a tricky world. Okay, um, those, those are the two bits there. Um, coming on to Ross's uh, leading question. Um, when quite a high percentage of times when companies get in touch with Swoop about funding, they have an idea in their brain already as to what they think is the best solution. Okay. Our system has access to over a thousand different funding providers. So one of the things that will often happen is somebody will be going, I'm looking to consolidate all my loans and get them in one place, because I think if I do that, I'm going to get myself a better rate, right? Which is probably not going to be the right thing. You know? But what somebody's able to do with us is able to go, actually, I'm looking for funding. Um, uh, what sort of solutions are available? And it may be that something like VAT funding is the right route. It may be that something that helps them with their corporation tax is the right route. It may be that their the trade finance is the right route. Um, so the, the, the solutions are very, very, very wide. To expect an S for somebody who runs an SME to know what's the best solution is ludicrous yeah, because it's not their skill set. A funding manager is able to step back and go, well, that works for you. You're paying too much for that. Goodness. One of the things that Ross was saying is if somebody's credit score has been impacted, um, you will often see somebody who goes, well, I've approached funding circle already and got rejected. And we'll go, well, of course, that's because you didn't fit funding circles criteria. Your credit score is 32. They're going to reject you. What can we do to improve your credit score before we go out and apply? Because let's say if funding circles credit, you need to have a credit score minimum of 65. Let's use somebody to improve your credit score who gets paid on a success basis to get it up to 65. We can then go and apply. So it's back to the, the point I suppose I was making at the beginning. Use a professional because that's what they do all day long. Yeah. One of the things that sometimes happens is people think if I speak to a professional, they're going to rip me off. No, a professional is going to want to work with you long term. So if they are professional, they're going to want to give you good advice because they're going to want to coat, hang on your coattails as you go from six and a half million to 10 million. Uh, quick Andrew Moon rant over. I'll now stop talking again. Back to Ross. Thanks so much, Andrew. I think the thing is that a lot of people in business uh, are shy of talking about the issues that they have as if it's a sort of frailty or a sign of weakness. Um, and uh, on, on that basis, it's quite the opposite. If you open up, one, you get an awful lot of help from people. You get a lot of, you know, build trust actually by opening up and then you get the better kind of advice. And uh, and I think you become more inspired to actually put it into place as well. You've built, it builds your confidence. But Peter, have you got any thoughts on on these on these matters? Sorry, I'm, I'm still my head's still full of um, Fursley Gardens, which I love. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm a bit of a curveball there. So I was at Eden Project last week, and um, I was dragged there kicking and screaming, being a bit of a sort of um, dinosaur. You know, it was fantastic. And um, can I just deal with that? Get this out of my head because I'm just sort of full of. Um, Eden project, and then making a quick comparison to Thursday, and seeing how they've um, have they diversified? But no, I, I guess they've got the same sort of issues. Let me just do one minute on this, because it's just to get it out of the way. So it was the thick end of hundred and five pounds for four people to be um to be an Eden project, and of course there's a bit like the old uh, Merlin pass that, <laughs> that Victoria mentioned. You know, it's a hundred and whatever it is. Um, but for just a little extra, a little extra 20%, you can have, and that's why it's a year. But if you have a 20% um, uplift on that, you can have a three-year or five-year pass. So they've, they've done that little tweaking, clever membership thing. Um, and I remember the, uh, the, the cafe prices. Well, you know, that's, uh, that's you know, I think I've, I've bought cars less than I paid in, the, in their restaurant um, for um, you know, toasted sandwiches and coffees. But obviously, you've looked at your pricing. But that was, that was um, staggering. 
Um, with their diversification, not too much diversification, but almost a, a stretch in the, uh, the, um, the start, was uh, around, it's that Labradoodle again, sorry, was um, around Go Ape, of course, you know, bringing in that sort of organisation where they pay rental for the ground rent and what have you. And um, the other organisation they have was the one of these sort of um, zip wire companies that really do it properly the, right across the whole site. But, you know, that, that sort of diversification. Mm -hmm. So I found that quite good. Um, do you know, access to finance were asked all the time by our businesses. Um, I would have, I would, I would go to Andrew, really, frankly. We've got um, a couple of advisors who try and cover all the bases on where to go for funding, what sort of grants are available and everything else. But someone like um, Andrew's organisation, Refreshed Every Day, seems very sensible. Again, picking up what you said, Ross, about businesses often don't want to talk about the sort of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'm going to let the dog out. It's right behind me. Two seconds. It's I need that dog walking service, Victoria. That's what I need. <laughs> um, so we had, about three years ago, we had reasonable reserves, but because of all these government contracts were involved in and a lot of European stuff at the time, we needed probably about uh, ten thousand pounds little safety net for about six months because of the vagaries of bills being settled by Brussels and so on and so forth. And we did the rounds, and um, the interesting the, you never stop learning, do you? So, well, we have what um, what have we got behind you? We said, well, it's about three and a half million euros stroke pounds here of, of contracts, uh, government funded, lock solid. That's that's what we've got. I said, what have you got for assets? And um, we said, okay, yes, that's right. Well, we rent three offices. Yeah, that doesn't count. Um, so we ended up with about 32 computers and a, and a photocopy. Photocopy is all we owned. We couldn't get um, our own bank that we've been with for 15 years without any red figures ever. Um, it just, wow, well, Andrew would have had a thousand stories like this. We couldn't find anybody. Uh, and eventually we found somebody um, who lent to colleges who would give an unsecured loan that still had a bit of a reputation rather than someone a little bit dark, shall we say, and um, a little bit sort of a you know dubious without a track record. By the time we'd done all this wiring and sorted it out, the problem had gone away. It was hellishly difficult to find funding unless we could put up some serious, um, you know, some serious assets. So it's it's an obvious question, but we fell into that trap, you know, and uh, we got through it and. Yeah, not good, not good. Sorry, that's, I, uh, that's really, that's really interesting. We, we, the, the anecdotes, it's behind the anecdotes that we could get the learning. I think Nick's getting his coat, but uh, but there's uh, part of it. <laughs> there's um, thank you, Nick. That was a we, we enjoyed that. And um, so Nick Callum, uh, agent uh, Abana, have we got questions? Let's let please because we've got a final few minutes. And then we're going to then we're going to ask everyone to wrap up. But I want to hear from those who haven't asked their questions. So, Adrian, you've put your camera on. I presume you've got a question. Oh, I apologise. I've only just managed to join the meeting. And uh, and if you've been talking about access to funding, then then our challenge is always that we're, our customers actually um, uh, uh, effectively give us loans um, to cover our working capital. But in return, we have to provide them with a bank guarantee. Um, and so raising those bank guarantees is infinitely impossible. Um, our, our, our current contract is for £27 million for the customer in, um, in Japan. And RBS wanted us to provide £80 million worth of collateral in order to raise those bank guarantees. Um, so... Um, Eventually, after nine months of negotiation, we managed to get uh, um, Tokyo Marine to provide us an insurance-based bank guarantee to cover uh, the uh, to cover that um, cover that requirement. But that that cost us over a hundred million pounds in a uh, hundred thousand pounds in in uh, in legal fees to organise that. Like Andrew, that. do you have any thoughts for Adrian? Um, we have a. Uh, a specialist guy in the team called Mark Robinson. Um, and what Mark Robinson would do is he would hear the story. And when he's heard the story and looked at the financials, 
he'd be able to go, do you know what? I think I can take this to specialist funder X, Y, and Z. Yeah. But having heard your financials and the story, he'd be able to give you, before he went to them, an idea of what he could raise and what the indicative cost was going to be. You then go, you plug that into your system, and if, it, if you felt that that, just, just one second, you felt that that would work, he would then write a, a basic paper to the specialist funders, yeah, um, which is not a credit application. It's just him saying, look, I know you like this space. Yeah, Do you like the look of this one? And if they went, yeah, bring it on, then go through the sort of formal process of business plans, what you need, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all he does all day long. Um, and is is get out of bed. Is, is, he doesn't do anything below half a million quid. So not really my skill set, but that's what Mark does. Thank you. Well, maybe Adrian and Andrew should get together and have a have a have a chat about that for future reference. Not... Stacy will Stacy will send the link. That's the easiest thing. Yeah. yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Adrian, and welcome. Please. Uh, um, the the. Programs being recorded, so we will sh share it so you yes. can see everything that's been said. Um, Albana, hi everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Perfect. Um, so it's my first time doing anything like this. So, um, um, not uh, the only really question I have is probably quite a broad question. So I don't want to open up a can of worms, but um, so I've been a commercial finance broker for. Uh, well, I've been in the industry for several years, so um, and I've just very recently bitten the bullet and set up by myself. So it's quite scary because every time I speak to business owners, I think, wow, how brave of them to do it. So, you know, to quit a POA job and so forth. My only real question is, because obviously everyone here is quite skilled, is just sort of in the first 12 months, like how to just sort of keep yourself positive, because I've been doing it for about two weeks and I started right on the Easter break which was probably the worst time to start as well so I thought oh my good lord so um, what have I just done to myself um should I go and apply to Tesco but no but realistically it's about um because I think a lot of the times you have to be your own motivator um and being you know uh, being in the industry that I am at the moment is up and down, up and down, up and down, you know, and I've heard a lot of people say, like, I've got this issue, this issue, so and so forth, and your issues are our issues as commercial brokers, but um, just as a business owner, like, how, what, what's, like, two, three best pieces of advice that you would say to just not have a mental breakdown, I suppose, <laughs> in the first 12 well, months and go, I, oh, I do. okay, now I need to check myself into a, <laughs> into a rehab. I do know the the big the biggest issue is, is that is that self and it is also you know the isolation that you can feel you know you do have to get up and you have to you have to make sure that you know you, you, all around you are the kind of positive support structures that you need in place. But we've got some brilliant people that can help you with this. I'm I'm looking I'm particularly looking at Peter, Victoria, and Alpa. This is your day job. This is what you do. So please let's let's dig into this and and how can we help alpo fire away. okay so first of all Abana, well done for taking the plunge uh, and joining the club um you know what it is it is a roller coaster i i, I, I remember my first 12 months i had no idea what i was doing um i made it up as i went along but i figured if i'm doing something even if it goes wrong, and that's okay for something to go wrong, I've learned something from it. So, you know, make loads of mistakes and forgive yourself when you make them and take the time to think about it. It's okay, well, I'm not going to do that again because of X, Y, and Z. And all of this builds your own knowledge. And with that knowledge comes an inner confidence. Yeah. Um, and I think that is the, that's the key thing um, I would say. The other thing I'd say is, your reason why it is incredibly lonely there are days when you know you you, you want to tear your hair out um as well as the highs there are the lows so having a reason why um whatever that is for you personally that gets you out of bed is a key thing and the third thing i would say that's really important is having a mentor um and when I mean a mentor, I'm, I'm forgive anyone who's a business coach or anything here, but a mentor 
that is maybe five years from where you want to be right now. So someone who's done that journey and who's been there. Uh, in my early days, I was privileged enough to be mentored by a lady called Sharon Bamford. And Sharon Bamford was the CEO of UK India Business Council. She knew absolutely everyone. At that time, it was Tony Blair's government. She knew absolutely everyone from there to the dragons to business people. And I cold called her once to sell her marketing services. And it was her first day on the job. And she answered the phone because it was her first day on the job and she was taking all the calls. That would never have happened six months later. And we got talking and she actually had three boys. She ran a series of nurseries and grown them, exited them. And then eventually she um, became the CEO for UK India Business Council. And she didn't buy from me. But one thing that struck me was that there was so much experience that I could gain from. So I said to her, Sharon, will you mentor me? I just asked her, be ballsy, just ask it. And she said, sure. I said, I promise I won't waste your time. I will do what you need to do and all the rest of it. And what was really useful is I then had her number and permission to call her. And there were days when I would ring and all I wanted to go is go. And that was frequent. I'll be honest with you, that was frequent. And she would deal with it by saying, breathe. What's the problem? What's the solution? She never told me what to do. She just calmed me down so I could think with clarity as to how I'm going to do it. Then I tell her what I was going to do. And she goes, that's right. That's exactly what I would do. Now go do it. And that was my sanity check. So I would say a good mentor won't charge you. They, you know, particularly a female. Um, I think if you're a female entrepreneur, a female, I think all of us, Victoria, will agree as we rise up, we should be pulling up more women as we're going up the ladder ourselves. I'm a firm believer in that. So for me, it's those things I think will keep you solid for the next 12 months and just keep your eye on the prize and small steps. Yeah, a baby doesn't learn to walk straight away. They fall down, they get up, they fall down and eventually they, they figure it out. So that that's my advice to you. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Alpha. You very Victor much. Victoria, I know yeah. Al Alpha touched upon kind of coaching methods there. That's, yeah. a, that's a strong suit for you, isn't it? Yeah, really? absolutely. Yeah, um, that's exactly it. So I I've got a number of pieces of advice for you. Um, yet, yeah, as Alpha said, well done. It's nearly been 10, well, I think it's about 10 years now that I've been um, in business on my own. And it is every day comes with a different challenge and different people and different thoughts and, you know, many different paths that you can take. And I think that that sometimes um, can be a good thing and a bad thing. So my first piece of advice to you would be that when it feels like you do have that massive mountain to climb to get where you want to go, think about creating small um, micro goals and kind of like mini milestones along the way. Because if you're trying to say, for example, get to your first X um, amount of money, uh, that feels like a real hard task. But if you break it down into mini milestones, uh, that will help you to kind of feel like you're achieving on a regular basis, because otherwise the mind can get overwhelmed and you can be kind of dragged down. So celebrate the small things, reach small milestones, celebrate them and move on from them. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, secondly, one of the big things when you first go into business is if when you're working alone, you can really lose your self-confidence. You can think, oh, are they going to want to hear from me? Um, am I good enough? There's so many other people out there. They're better than I am. And these voices are just ringing in your head all of the time. So one of the things that um, I would just invite yourself to do every time you're feeling those things is, number one, I've got to get visible. And when you feel those things in your mind holding you back, ask yourself, are those customers better with me or without me? And of course, the answer is they're better with you. You've got something highly valuable to offer to them. And therefore, let that be the driver of you having that voice and moving forward, because actually you're doing them a favor. You're not selling to them. You're offering some value to help them enhance their life in some way. So reframe any negative thoughts that are going through your head. Um, get out and meet people. The Hampshire Chamber of Commerce, if you're not already a member, um, well worth investigating membership because number one, um, the community that sits around the Hampshire Chamber of Commerce is brilliant. There's so many events for you to get out, 
uh, to, not only online, but face to face as well. And you'll meet people and you will do business with those people. Networking at this stage in the game for you is imperative. And um, the more you connect, the more you will get back, I suppose, is what I will say. And don't be afraid to seek help. Have these chats, um, talk to people, because there, there are and have been and will continue to be long after people that are in the same boat as you. And, um, you know, I think that one of the key things is that you've got to reach out for help and don't feel like it's a failure if it's, uh, if it's all on you. You've got to reach out and get that help. So there's four things from me. But fundamentally, your visibility is number one now. And you've got to work out what your first step is. If you need cash in the bank right now, you need your first 90 day plan to get you where you need to go. And like I said in the chat, my details are in there. If you want to chat, by all means, um, do do come and talk to me because I'm more than happy to give you some tips on that, on how to get yourself started in that first 90 days. Thank you so very much. Milestones of everything. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to finish up at quarter past. And I'm going to be asking the, the panellists to give me give us their one, so think about these, your one strong takeaway from today. And uh, literally just a few seconds for your one strong takeaway. But I know that Andrew's got his hand up. I think he wants to help Albana and also Peter. So we'll just do that quickly, but literally a minute each because we've got to be wrapping up in five. Andrew. Bam, bam, as fast as I can. Three possible things are going to happen. It's going to get better. So you've got something to look forward to. It's going to stay the same. So get used to the way it is, or it's going to get worse. If it gets worse, you're going to be able to get out of it and do something else. First point. Second point, everyone you've ever historically dealt with will have had a professional advisor. Those professional advisors obviously didn't have access to commercial finance, so they're people you can get in touch with. Third point, um, if you talk to Swoop, you'd be able to register on our system as an advisor. So for all the things that you don't do, we'd be able to support you in that. So rather than you're just specializing in the areas that you know about at present, you'd be able to be whole of market. So you'd be able to use our system for covering your clients, for equity, for the debt solutions that you don't know anything about, and be able to use our systems to show them what grants they could get. And we pay you. That's me. That sounds good, Andrew. Thank you, Peter. Dog's gone, I think. It's chasing the dog down the road. Yeah. Oh, no, he's back. No, Thank you. Apologies, right. Peter, Peter, I thought you were on mutt, not on mute. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. I well, apologize for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we we'll, we'll keep going on this, couldn't we? Right, very, very quickly. Um, yeah, we, we've, we've done startup support for about sort of um, 800 businesses. Yeah, great. What does it mean? How many of those have failed after a certain period? The, the failure rates can be really bad news for businesses. If there's one thread that really works, and um, don't roll the eyes, everybody, but it does work. It's a business plan. It doesn't have to be war and peace. It doesn't have to be 30 pages. And God forbid, don't Google the words business plan. You'll lose the will to live. There's thousands of models out there. All I'd say is um, we tend to use just a five simple points, five paragraph business plan, you know, um, paraphrasing. I'll probably miss one. You know, where are your customers coming from? What is it you're selling or producing? Your, your pricing, how do you know what your pricing is? What's the competition up to? Marketing visibility, thank you, Victoria. That's the absolute killer. Um, and of course, un underpinning all of this is, the, is your cash flow. That's got to be the bedrock of you know, sustaining and, uh, and eventually hopefully growing. But um, if you need a business plan model, I said there's thousands out there, but I can, um, for the price of an email, just simply send you this sort of simple guide that we've got um, which inspire an enterprise, which is why it's branded as such. That's a project we've been um, delivering across um, Hampshire and Surrey uh, with European and, and government and LEP funding. And it's just coming to an end now. But we can certainly give you the, um, the, the, the tips on that if you'd like. Thank you, Peter. So fine, we're going to do our takeaways. And uh, it's, uh, we're going to start with Victoria. Very briefly, what's your, what's your classic takeaway? What have, what have we learned today? What should we do? Yeah, OK, I'm going to keep it really, really brief. Um, coming back to what I said right at the beginning, and I've mentioned it several times, visibility, get visible. Uh, if you're not visible and you're not doing marketing and you're not getting yourself out there, 
then you're the best kept secret and you're choosing to deprioritize the growth of your business. So visibility is number one. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not out there and people don't know about you, you're not going to get business in the door. So that's my first point, visibility. Create time for it. Time is so important. The more you do, the more you'll do. So action creates action. Whereas if you're inactive, it creates more inaction. So like attracts like. So do remember that. So uh, time is really important. If it's not in the diary, it doesn't get done. So allocate time for your business growth, working on your business, as we all say. And have the right people on your team. Reach out to those people that have offered you support today. They are in it to give value. So don't, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Reach out. Do what you've got to do to make sure that you prioritize the growth of your business. Um, people you. are buying. People are buying. Uh, recession is it isn't it i don't know but people are buying they are so just get out there and get visible thank you victoria i think you cheated but anyway that was good three three takeaways there but uh visibility time and team thank you alpa right for me uh, the key takeaways are be flexible and adaptable um resilience is the key to a successful business in any economic climate uh focus on your key strengths uh Collaborate with other businesses. And um, I also agree with what Victoria said on all of those other things, because it's nothing is a silo. Everything works together. So for me, the key takeaways are those things. And don't talk yourself into a recession. Things are never as bad as the media would like to make out. Just keep going. Keep plugging away. You will eventually get to where you need to get to. And that journey might not be in a straight road. You might have taken a few details but you'll be there so that's thank my takeaways thank you alpha i think we're following the rule of three here aren't we by the looks of it so that was flexibility resilience and collaboration well done very good andrew please the takeaway this is not one of mine uh, there's an seis fund that we work with and one of their criteria when they're investing into a business is to recognize that the business they're investing into now won't necessarily be the same business when they exit, that the company will mutate and change along the way. So if you're running a business, be prepared to continually embrace change and be aware that where you are now could be completely different from where you are in 10 years time, but just keep going. Thanks, Andrew. Embracing change, 100%. Peter, please. I'll try and come up with something different because I mean, there's lots of good points and tips I think we've covered today. One thing that, um, again, I very happily missed um, in the infancy of my my own business was that, of course, if you're looking for customers, 90% um, of the time, they're coming from warm leads. They're coming from people you know, from networks you know. It's blindingly obvious, isn't it? But it's easy to forget. Um, and so, yeah, something like even the, the chamber network, you know, getting under the skin of that membership and the, the exposure that gives you to other, organ other, um, other uh, customers, potentially, but also trade bodies, and of course, you know, all the professional links you've made in the past that it's milking, not milking. Yeah, it is milking those. It is milking those. Um, you know, the number of cold calling stuff and e-shots and what have you. We do a simple um, newsletter out to about 5,000 people. We're not trying to sell things to um, sell and ram, ram things down their throats all the time. But it's just, um, yeah, that sort of visuality, scenting their territory, as, as someone once said to me in a very tasteful way. That, that's that's the one that I think I would um, I'll stick with today. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. We're going to be wrapping up now. Um, thank you very much uh, to the to the panel, to to Andrew, to Victoria, to Alpa, to Peter. You've been splendid, and uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce really thanks you for your efforts today. It's been fantastic, and thank you so much to all of the um, members today who have participated and asked such interesting questions and yeah it is about your visibility and your time and your teams and your flexibility and your resilience and it is about you collaborating and it is about embracing change and it is about building your network so I can't think of a better way of ending today than to than, the, than on those takeaways thank you so much we do these chamber of solutions regularly we're trying to build the audience for them Apologies if there's any problem today with regard to the links that we sent, but I think we got we got here in the end, and we'll make sure that we see you all next time. Uh, please look out for it. I'll be sending personal invitations out to you all and to others, and please spread the word. 
Stoneman Solutions is really here to make a difference for your business. Thank you so much. Could I ask the panel to please keep on and we'll we'll just chat at the end. But uh, thank you, everybody else, and have a fantastic week and a fantastic year. <laughs>